So my dad called me from Seattle a while back, telling me about his plans to write a new groundbreaking novel that was entitled, Harry Potter Goes to College. <laughs> and in this novel, he uh, planned to document the newly ripened wizard and follow his experiences, but on an American campus. And so in addition to you know, completely ignoring copyright laws and stealing intellectual property, my dad had also never even read the actual Harry Potter books. And so, before I really dive into this story, I can already tell what you're thinking. What? <laughs> Either this guy is crazy, or rather you're probably thinking, this guy is crazy, but I know exactly where this story is headed. Either way, you're right. Because my dad, for the past few decades, has been living with bipolarity. And so, while we were brainstorming through this phone call that connected two very different realities, I could once again feel the familiar weight that accompanied my father's bipolarity returning as well. Now I'm obviously open to the whole process. But the first time that I was forced to face my father's illness, I didn't really understand how complicated it was because I'd barely turned 12 years old. To begin with, my dad is already a bit manic, and so as a 12-year-old kid, I just saw him as overly excited. I saw him throwing himself into every facet of human experience, and so I wanted to jump in there with him. But granted, I wasn't around to experience the darker side of the mania, like the hallucinations or the night spent in the hospital but I was there when it all came down. And so I'd just like my experience to echo the many voices that we're gonna hear throughout this week by saying that depression is immeasurably crippling. Sure, it's been a while, and so the days are hazy in memory, I'll admit, but I do remember a few details very clearly. I remember coming home to our house that was completely reorganized by my completely unorganized dad, and I remember the night spent with my ear pressed to the floorboards trying to listen to my father cry softly below me as the fan above me did nothing but stir the summer heat. Hearing your father cry is an act that kids experience all too rarely. And so in my immaturity, I was embarrassed and afraid of so much more than just the fact that my dad was slowly going crazy. I had to confront the vulnerability in a man who had literally and emotionally raised me, but also changed some of my ideas of what I thought it meant to have a mental illness. Now, this change didn't exactly come easy, but I'm so grateful for it, and I've come to learn more about myself and the human condition that I had ever thought possible. And sure, this came through you know, grief and trauma and all of this confusion, but I'm so grateful for it because when the inevitable call came to extend my father's journey for another bout with mania and depression, those subsequent times I was able to accept my father's condition despite my own vulnerability. Ironically, the same fluidity behind mental disorders that I now find so fascinating, that's what's prevented these very same disorders from gaining societal acceptance in the same way that physical illness has. Our society has become so driven around self-improvement that sometimes mental illness gets confused with mental weakness. And we know that this isn't the case, but it's been so ingrained into the fabric of who we are in this country that even if you lived in a perfect world, full of perfect people who fully understood that mental illness is just the same as physical illness. You would still have to convince yourself that you are not weak, that mental illness is perfectly normal, even that you are normal, which can be one of the most difficult things to do. Now, we all understand how damaging misconceptions can be. But that also means that we have a real opportunity to affect change by simply changing the perspectives of others. I could have easily just ignored my father's illness and dismissed it as simple craziness. But what have been, would have been even more naive was to, be, to, to ignore the fact that there were physical reasons behind the physical differences in our realities. These aren't just issues of the mind and its thoughts. They're also issues of the brain and its chemistry. And I may be just a teenager, but I have a very profound understanding for how complicated the brain is. And so I know that when we talk about drugs and neurotransmitters, that that's not reductionistic of mental illness at all. And if anything, it just complicates matters. And it certainly doesn't reduce your experience, you know, your, your emotions and your thoughts to a simple chemical imbalance. But no matter how we frame mental illness, What's most important is that our perception and our treatment of mental illness, that that at least reflects the complexity of these disorders themselves. Now, um, now, 
Now, just as there are two aspects uh, to mental illness, you know, the thoughts and the chemistry, there's also two avenues of treatment that we have to pursue in order to really treat these disorders. And that is to treat them directly and indirectly. Now, my natural tendency would be to completely ignore my own advice and just, just treat these disorders directly. I would try to, you know, get to the bottom of this and, and, and cure the, disorder, the disorders and the diseases, so to speak. And that works great if you're a mental health professional or someone working in a lab, but that, I think we can all agree that if you're a family member and friends, if you tell your, your loved ones that, you know, they need to just fix themselves and somehow get over it, that that doesn't exactly work. And so, what I really want to talk to you about today is the other aspect of mental illness and the other avenue of treatment, and that is the power of a community. There are so many people here today, like myself, who desperately want to help, but who are just looking for a way that they can, they can help contribute to this community. But what can we as family members and do to cure such a, such a persistent and, and stubborn biochemical disease? I would argue that we can't do anything. I would say that it's not my job to fix my dad. It's not my responsibility to stabilize his chemistry, and so I certainly don't hold myself responsible if I can't stabilize his patterns of thinking. Instead, what, what I'm really here to do is to just make my dad's life easier by providing him with emotional support. Because often when, when the people closest to us are focused too much on trying to fix our biggest problems, they ignore those little things that they can do to make life easier. And like I said, this isn't exactly my natural inclination. I've had to learn this from examples. I think the best example was when my dad was as depressed as I've ever seen him, my grandma came and she just made sure that every morning we had muffins. She didn't try to get to the bottom of his psychosis or delusions or whatever you want to call it. She just made sure that every morning we started the day off right. Because for mental illness, even exercising and talking with friends and eating right, that can be just as important as medication for treatment. Again, the treatment that we're ultimately seeking is holistic because we understand much, um, because we're talking about mothers and daughters and fathers and sons. Not just cerebral soup that's somehow missing an ingredient. And I've talked all around America trying to get people to change their perspective on mental illness. But I don't think that's really what we need here today. Instead, the change that I so desperately want to see from the mental health care community, and NAMI specifically, is a network of support starting immediately from the ground up. I remember being so confused because I was never contacted as a part of treatment. I was just a son. And so as soon as a diagnosis is given, let's start finding ways that we can include family members and friends in those critical early conversations. I'm not claiming to be an expert in this field, but what I know more than anything else is that us ordinary people, we can play a key role in this by finding those small and simple ways to simply make lives easier for those people that we love. This, these are societal issues. And so if we wanna change society, the easiest way to do that is by involving them directly. We can all just combat this with love and support and late night conversations and posts on social media. And the most important thing of all, uncomfortably long hugs. <laughs> we can all simply speak up and speak out and be heard and show love and listen well. Now, there are many things that can and need to be changed about our mental health care system. But the bottom line is that we as human beings, we have to be a part of the human change. And if I've been if I've learned one thing, having been raised in a patriarchal society, it is that there is nothing more weak than telling another man that you truly love him. And Dad, I love you. I believe in part that your journey has made us the men that we are today. Because we've laughed harder for all the time spent crying, and we've appreciated spring for all the winters, and we've marveled on mountaintops at all the valleys that lay below and behind us. Through your precipitous highs and seemingly endless lows, 
we have both loved more and been loved more. And all in all, I've just come to the realization of the intense beauty that it can exist in an uneven balance between mania and depression. So I want to challenge all of you to call one person who is in desperate need of your love, and let's make this world an easier and more loving place to live in. Thank you.